This morning, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hosea. We're working our way through this wonderful book, verse by verse. There's an outline in your chapter today. We're in chapter 4, The Polluted People. In chapter 4, the tragic home life, now it's been tragic, has it not? The tragic home life of Hosea is swallowed up by the tragedy of his national, of his homeland. I mean, what's going on with Israel is so much bigger than what's going on in his own family. Kind of like America today, right? What's going on is so much larger and threatens all of us. God has convened a court and will be bringing charges against Israel, that is the northern kingdom. Now here's an axiom that you can uh, remember. Until people experience the guilt of conviction, they cannot enjoy the glory of conversion. There's some truth in that. Until there has been, and I like Warren Beersby, until there has been that conviction, you're certainly not going to enjoy the glory of conversion. One of our founding fathers made this statement. He said, Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. And that was a long time ago. Don't you know he trembles today? Whether or not Jefferson was a Christian, he read the Bible and he understood that God builds upon the principles of and the precepts in the Bible. That's the way God does it. The psalm says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. God builds his throne, and he builds nations, and he builds families and individuals on righteousness and justice. Neglect these, and anything you build, a family, a state, a nation, will crumble. So let's dig in today to see the court case and what's going on with Hosea. Notice with me the Lord's controversy with Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. No, that's not the day's news. That was written a few hundred years ago. But we understand it's still true today. Because of this, the land dries up. Now get that. Because of this, the land dries up. And all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the fish of the sea are swept away. But let no one bring a charge. Let no one accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against the priest. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. So I will destroy your mother. God calls the court to order. He walks in. All rise. And then I will judge the Lord God of the universe. Thank you. You may be seated. You realize who's in charge in the courtroom, right? It's not you. It's the guy at the desk. And here sits the Lord God. He's got some charges to bring against them. He says, first of all, let's talk about what lacks in your country. He says, you're lacking faithfulness, love, and acknowledgement of God in the land. Now, that's what you don't have that you need. Now, he said, now let me tell you some things that abound. He said, there's cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery, bloodshed that follows bloodshed. Now, Israel would have been allowed to enter a plea. And she would have said, not guilty. Now, why are these things wrong? I mean, my parents did them. Everybody else is doing them. Why are these things wrong? Who gets to decide and who gets to set the rules? God does. He not only decides and sets the rules, he enforces the rules. The Bible clearly teaches that Israel was familiar with the Psalms. The Bible says, The Lord is a God who avenges. O God who avenges, shine forth. Rise up and judge the earth. Pay back to the proud what they deserve. How long, Lord, will the wicked, how long will the wicked be jubilant? They pour out arrogant words. All the evil, evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the foreigner. And they murder the fatherless. They say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not take notice. Since God sets the rules and God enforces them, we are to follow His laws, right? How many of you said, as long as you live in this house, you're going to follow these rules. We thought as parents we got to set the rules in the house. And he thinks since this is his house, he gets to set the rules. And he does. He said, 
There's no faithfulness. There's no loyal love. There's no love to the Lord nor to others. There's bloodshed after bloodshed. The people are false-hearted toward God and hard-hearted toward men. There's a real problem here, God says. In verse 3, he says, now because of this, here's the accusation, here's what I've got against you. Now because of this, or therefore, it's the cause and effect law. You're familiar with that? You jump out of a tree, how many times do you hit the ground? <laughs> <laughs> cause and effect. It's called gravity. It's the law that God put in place. So we know that cause and effect. It's the principle of talking Galatians of reaping and sowing. He said, the effect of your sin is the land will be dry. The people are wasting away. The animals, the birds, and the fish are destroyed. The people, like the prophets, stumble. The end result, I will destroy your mother, that is Israel. As I look at our great nation, this America that we love, I can't help but think that we are on a dangerous cliff. We've reached this precipice. We're, we're there. And, and I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But don't you feel like we're close to the end time? Amen. I, I mean, how much more will God put up with? <laughs> how far till we reach the point of no return? Or have we reached that? I believe the judge of the earth, the Lord God himself, would say to us, there is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery that breaks all bounds in bloodshed. When words like this are spoken, what should we do? I mean, when God accuses us and he's got all the facts, what should we do? Well, the New Testament answers that. The Bible says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? He said, That's a great question. Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Believer, I believe America needs to repent. That's just as clear as I can say it. America needs to repent. Now, if you're not a believer, you need to repent, receive Christ as your Lord, Savior, and be baptized, okay? Then we will talk about what to do next. That's the first step for you. But Christians in America, we need to repent. You and I are responsible for this country. Now, I talk a lot about Washington, what I don't like. But I'm responsible. You and I are responsible for ourselves and for this nation. And Peter says, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Get saved yourself, and then go share that message with somebody else and save them. That's right. And then share that message with somebody else and reach them. And then we can save this generation. That's what we are to be doing. That's the controversy. Now let's examine the Lord's commentary. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your, of your God, I will also ignore your children. The more the priests there were, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glorious God for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people and relish in their wickedness. And it will be like people, like priests. I will punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat, but not have enough. They will engage in prostitution, but not flourish. Because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution, old wine, new wine, take away their understanding. My people consult a wooden idol and a diviner's rod speaks to them. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. They sacrifice on the mountaintops and burn offerings on the hills under the oak, poplar, and terebinth, where the shade is pleasant. Therefore your daughters turn to prostitution and your daughters-in-law to adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots. 
and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes, a people without understanding will come to ruin. Now there's the basic sin of ignorance. <clears throat> they didn't know God or His Word. There was no knowledge of God in the land. Because of this lack of knowledge, they were going to be destroyed. But, but now this lack of knowledge was more than just not knowing. This lack of knowledge was like having a Bible on your coffee table and not reading it. They had access to it. They knew what it said. They just ignored it. This word, to know it, is the word used in Genesis 4.1 where it says, you know, Adam knew his wife. It was a personal, intimate kind of knowledge. To know God is to have a personal, intimate knowledge of Him through faith in Christ. Jesus discussed this in the Gospel of John. He said, now this is eternal life. If you don't know what eternal life is, Jesus said, let me define it for you. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God personally, intimately, lovingly. It's more than head knowledge. You with me? It's more than head knowledge. It is heart and experiential knowledge. The people were both ignorant by choice. The priests, they exchanged their glorious God for something disgraceful. They fed on the wickedness of the people, and God promises to punish both. Now, y'all, there's no way that's good news. There's no way that's, that's bad. Israel was in trouble. Solomon dies, and his son gets some counsel. He takes the poor counsel, and because he chooses the poor counsel, the kingdom is divided. And when the kingdom is divided, there is big trouble because the priest understood God himself appointed the priest through the line of Aaron, and God had given a king, and they were going to follow that bloodline. And so what happens? Read with me what the Bible says. The priests and the Levites from all their districts throughout Israel sided with him. The Levites even abandoned their pasture lands and property and came to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them as priests. All the godly people left the country. That's not good. It goes on to say in verse 15. When he appointed his own priests for the high places, and for the goat and calf idols he made. Those from every tribe of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord, the God of Israel, followed the Levites to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. They strengthened the kingdom of Judah and supported Rehoboam, son of Solomon, three years, following the ways of David and Solomon during this time. What is the new king going to do? He's the king, but all the priests leave. All the, all the people who followed the Lord left. What's he going to do? Well, if I'm not careful, my people will cross the border and go down to Jerusalem to worship there. Because that's where the Lord said worship. So, hey, let's come up with a plan. Let's get the people together in the Senate, the House, and let's come up with another plan. Let's come up with this plan and say, hey, let's make our own gods here in our cities. And so they set up these new priests. But Jeroboam is now desperate and does the unbelievable. Notice that the Bible says these new priests did, they had high places for the goat and the calf idols they made. Really? The lack of knowledge of the Lord God, them choosing not to do it, they understood they could have known, but they chose not to know this, is costly. These false priests went along with the idea of idol worship. Had they forgotten that once in their history there had been a golden calf? And what happened there? You know, like they all died? Have they forgotten that? Haven't they been through this already? That ended badly and theirs is going to end badly. The lack of knowledge about the Lord God affected everything else. Worldly and ignorant spiritual leaders produce worldly and ignorant people. And that brought destruction to the land. It was cause and effect. Ninety years later, ninety years after what we're reading here in Hosea, Jehu becomes king. He tries to clean the place up. He tries to have a national revival. And he does really well in a lot of areas. But, you know, he chose to leave these false priests in office. That won't work. 
God says exactly who he wanted to be in the office. But Jehu, knowing that, chose not to do what God said, the lack of knowledge, made some bad mistakes. The kingdom is doomed. Hosea preaches about this horrible thing, about what will be reaped because of what you sown. He said, you have sown to the wind, and you are going to reap the whirlwind. And, and be assured of this, you are not exempt from that. I am not exempt from that. Our nation is not exempt from that. What we sow, we will reap. So in 722, about 30 years after this, Assyria arrives and literally obliterates the northern kingdom of Israel. I mean, obliterates them. Now let's make this personal. He said that has been personal. <laughs> let's make this personal. As goes the spiritual leadership, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes the morality. As goes the morality, so goes the nation. God's people, me and you, are to be light and salt in our community. When we are corrupt, the whole thing becomes corrupt. Hello. Amen. That's us. That's on us. I believe to be free, you must be responsible. Stop being a victim. Stop it. God has made you. You have direct access to the Lord God of the universe. Deal with Him. Deal with the issues. I want to be free, so therefore I'm responsible. If I want to be free from excess weight, I must exercise more, eat the right stuff, maybe even eat less stuff. He did not go there. <laughs> right? But who's responsible for the food that goes in my mouth? I've got to be me. I've never accidentally eaten anything. <laughs> That's got to be me. If I want to have, you know, a better retirement, then I've got to learn to make more, spend less, and budget better, right? That's on me. Who spends my money? Me. That's not your fault. That's not Washington's fault. That's on me. You see, if I want America to be great, I must be responsible. If you want America to be great, you must be responsible. I am responsible. And therefore, I say no more. No more. No more. Somewhere, I've got to speak up. Well, I still can. I've got to speak up and deal with these issues. Stand up and make my voice known. Because the Lord loves those who seek justice. Who love mercy and walk humbly. With him. You say, that sounds like a Bible verse. It is. It absolutely is. I am responsible. And once I realize that I'm responsible, then I have to do some things. You say, well, that doesn't sound very politically correct. Hello? I do not care about being politically correct. I don't. It doesn't matter to me. I want to be scripturally correct, spiritually correct. I want to do what the Bible says do because it says do it. Listen, one of these days I'm going to die. When I leave today, I'm going to a funeral. She's already stood before the Lord, and Lois is in heaven today. Okay? Because she did this, so you make sure you do this. When I die, I will not stand before the President of the United States. Thank God, amen. I will not stand before the U.S. Supreme Court. Thank God, amen. But I will stand before the one whose name is above every name. The name of Jesus. And as that name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And I want to be scripturally correct. Amen. Not politically correct. You say, well then I can't come back to this church. There are plenty of them that you can go to. Please go. This is just not it. We want to do what the Bible says because the Bible said it. And let's give it a Amen. We've got a whole city that we've got to reach. We've seen the controversy. We've seen the commentary. Now let's look at the caution. Though you Israel commit adultery, do not let Judah become guilty. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not go up to beth -Aden. Do not swear as surely as the Lord lives. The Israelites are stubborn like a stubborn heifer. How then can the Lord pasture them like lambs in a meadow? Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. Even when their drinks are gone, they continue their prostitution. Their rulers dearly love shameful ways. A whirlwind will sweep them away, and their sacrifices will bring them shame. God warns Judah. He said, don't be connected with them. Don't go up to Gilgal. Don't go up to Beth Haven. The priests have set up temples there to goats and calves. 
Don't you do it. Hosea changes the name of Bethel, the house of God, to beth Aven, or the evil house. How about that? A little tongue-in-cheek he's given there. Don't you go up to that evil house. Don't go there. And don't say as surely as the Lord lives. Just stop that. God didn't say it. And don't you put his name on it. The Lord says, Israel is stubborn like a heifer. Now this is ironic because they have built golden calves all over the country. <coughs> right? He said, bunch of stubborn heifers. And now you're worshiping the very thing that's condemning you. How can the Lord lead them by still waters or green pastures? Ephraim is joined in this idol worship. Now can you imagine God saying this about you? Leave him alone. Now those are some sad words. When God said he is so bad, he's so far down the road, he cannot come back. Leave him alone. Wow. The false priests might have been the ones who enticed these people to do these things. They might have been the one who enticed Gomer to go back into prostitution. Their rulers dearly love shameful ways. The false priests enjoyed the benefits, of course, of the temple prostitutes. As a broken-hearted Hosea writes this prophecy, maybe he envisioned his wife plying her trade because some evil priest put her up to it so he could make another dog. Pimping her out. The priest doing that. God will pronounce judgment and a guilty sentence on them. But that's next week in the next chapter. Let's talk about you for just a moment. If God were to put all your stuff on the scales... I mean, if this is a real court case, you got to put all your stuff on the scales. I mean, all your good stuff on one side, you've been a good person, and all your sins on the other side, how would the scales balance out? You say, well, I helped a little old lady across the street. Wonderful. We'll put that on the good side. Okay, you helped her. I'm glad that you helped her. But now let's put all of your sins on the other side. Huh. You say, well, I let somebody go in front of me at Walmart. Well, no, I didn't. I was mad. It's a long line. But maybe you let somebody go in front of you. I mean, you know, you start thinking about all the good stuff that you've done. But then you list your sins. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. You've done more than this. But I'm just going to list some of them. You, you list your sins on the other side, okay? What does it say? Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery, bloodshed. Hey, that's the list that Hosea gave us. Hadn't changed much, has it? Several thousand years hasn't changed much. But that's not all of it. If you go to the New Testament... The Bible says this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. What are they? Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. Put it on the scale. See where it balances out. You say, well, there are two or three of those I'm not done. <laughs> okay, I'll give you two or three you have done. But wouldn't you say that the scale is tipped heavy to the side of guilt? Yeah, that's right. that helping that little old lady was nice, but it won't balance out fits of rage and envy and jealousy. We're in trouble. According to the Bible, the only way to balance the scale is to have the righteousness of Christ applied to the scale. That's the only way. You cannot do enough good to make up for your sins. But the blood of Jesus can wash away all of your sins. He can and He will. The Bible says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the God-man Christ Jesus. See, the only one that can reach up and grab God and reach down and grab you is Jesus Himself. And that's why He died on the cross. He wants to be your mediator. He wants to be. But He will not force Himself on you. And you will die for lack of knowledge and spend eternity separated from him. You say, well, I heard the sermon. That's not, hearing is not enough. Don't just be a hearer of the word. We have to be a doer of the word also. You must repent of your sins and trust Christ. But for most of us, we're believers, and we've let our country go to hell in a handbasket. Hello? Amen. I'm responsible for this. And I will speak up. Believer, are you taking responsibility? Ask yourself, am I taking responsibility for myself, for my family? For my church, for my nation. Let's seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord. Let me ask you, when was the last time you were at this altar? Maybe that's the problem. We just don't want to humble ourselves publicly before the Lord God. 
We're too good for that. And we're doomed. And we're doomed. We have jumped off the cliff. But I pray it's not too late for us. I pray that we'll humble ourselves and surrender to the Lord God. You say, well, I, I've never done that to start with what I do. Well, the Bible says if you'll confess your sins, it means you agree with God you've done it. He sees the scale, right? He's got that. And then if you will receive Him as your Lord and Savior, then His blood is applied to your account and the scales tilt. Now you receive the righteousness of Christ. And the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. We do it in a very simple prayer. And I'd love to lead you in that prayer. But the altar is open for Christians who just say, I'm responsible. Enough's enough. Let's win this country for Christ. Would you pray with me? As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, let me lead you in this simple prayer. If you've never received Jesus, would you say in your heart, Father, forgive me. Jesus, save me. Holy Spirit, live in me. And if you pray that, in just a moment, we're going to let you come forward. You can tell me. We'll rejoice with you. We'll tell you what to do next. You can put it on one of our communication cards there in view in front of you. You can text me, email me, call me. You know all the ways to communicate. Just let us know that you've done that. Believer, this message was for me and for you. I've already been at the altar this morning several times. Would you be willing to humble yourself publicly today that God might get the glory and that we might see Him do something amazing in our personal life, our families, our church, and in this great nation? So, Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves today. We are not worthy, but we don't want to die for lack of knowledge. We want to live because we know the one, the one whose name is above every name. And we willingly, joyfully bend our knees before you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Would you stand with us, please?
Dr. Phillip, or you would like to do business with the Lord, you certainly can. Uh, Lynn, would you come stand with me? This is Lynn. She has come. I'd like to be done with you. Maybe we'll do it by her. Maybe we'll you come stand here with her. This is Megan's neighbor, and she desires membership in our church from uh, Sister Baby's church. She's been that she's been saved and spiritually baptized. So all of you who rejoice with me, give a good party. Amen and hand clap. Amen. This being though her first week here, she brought a visitor. Amen. Amen. What's your excuse? Find you somebody and bring them to church. Amen. And this one, I can sit down right there. In just a moment, we'll get through. I'll have you stand here. And everybody will come out and greet you and welcome you to the family. All right, this afternoon, as soon as we're through here, we have a church-wide fellowship, and we want you to stay. Uh, Will's class is putting this on, and there, there's food in the fellowship hall. They're out back cooking, probably eating at this very moment. So stay around, hang around with us, fellowship, get to know each other. Sit with somebody you don't know, amen? Get to know them, fellowship together, we'll have a good time. I'm sorry I'm bugging out. If you're going to the funeral with me, uh, you'll leave me over to the funeral home. Visitation's at 1, the funeral's at 2. All right? Would you stand together as we pray or dismiss? All right, as we'll see you. God, we're not in the Lord.